Hello, this is Richard, and thanks very much for taking the time out to join me in one of my one day one conversations. This is the second episode in this second series, and in this episode, I'm chatting to well known comedian Jimmy Cricket. It goes without saying, Jimmy's a household name, and I was delighted when I got the opportunity to catch up with him. So, thanks to David Hull from David Hull Promotions for introducing me to Jimmy, and of course, thanks to Jimmy's wife, May, who made all the arrangements. Hello, Jimmy. How are you? We're fine. We're fine. Oh. Yeah, we're looking out. There was a wee bit of fog over here in Rochdale last night. Right, okay. Uh, we had snow last week and loads and loads of rain, but just a wee bit fog. But it's not too bad now. We're hoping the sun will burst out from the clouds, you know, and cheer us all up after what we've all been through. Jimmy, I think somebody of your stature should be sitting in the south of Spain somewhere lapping up the sun. <laughs> <laughs> that was your well, chance to you say know, wise the problem, up. <laughs> the problem is, Richard, uh, when you do nothing, you don't know when you're finished. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Uh, well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. And obviously, I've been chatting to you last week and we've been building up to this, which is great. Uh, for me personally, it's. Yeah. An absolutely brilliant honour to, to, to spend the time that we are spending together. Because oh, it's uh, all my pleasure. Don't worry about that, Richard. It's really great to be chinwagging. You know, during the week I was talking to you and uh, I had to pinch myself sometimes to say, I'm actually sitting here chatting to the, the, the legendary Jimmy Cricket because... Ah, well, you're very in, kind now. In our house, you were a household name, you know. When I think of our house up in the Craigan and Mullen Gardens in Derry and uh, right. my daddy and my mommy all sitting around, they watch the Saturday night show with Jimmy Cricket, you know. Like yeah. and, and uh, they'd be all chuffed that I'm talking to you now. God rest them. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, that's all coming back to me now because uh, up in the, the wee attic room here, I'm I'm sort of typing a an autobiography, and then somebody I've got to that really, you know, that bit, and I'm you know thinking I don't want to leave anybody out. You know what? You when you do something like this, Richard, you know you oh, want wow. them. Uh, for for not only for being uh, what's the word the right thing to do, but for commercial reasons, because if they buy, <laughs> if they want to see their name, you know. <laughs> well, I would say, Jimmy, that in terms of your autobiography, there'll be some list of names on it and some some a listers on it too. My God. Well, I've been blessed, really, yeah. when you think of it, you know, yeah. uh, Richard, and uh, yeah, it's just lovely P people being there for you, you know, that were able to give you that wee leg up you know that we move on in your career at the right time it's so important that isn't it you know there's only 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 one tree and he's the one they're coming to see Going back to the Jimmy Mulgrew days, um, and you're originally from Cookstown. So yes. Just share a wee bit, if you don't mind, about your, your earlier life before the Jimmy Cricket years. Well, I was born in 1945. Now, just when the war ended, it was October the 17th. Yeah. So the mummy carried me through, really, I suppose, the last <laughs> nine six months of the war. When you think of it, I was probably oh in the God. safest place, wasn't I? Yeah, yeah, you definitely were. And also in Cookstown. Yeah. Even even Hitler couldn't uh, find Cookstown. <laughs> <laughs> he knew, yeah, yeah. That, no, there's no way. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny uh, that you remind me of a, a wee story when I read, you know, John Cleese, I read his book, and he said his father was a real character in a comedian. And he said, uh, the fact you could tell the Germans had a sense of humour by the very fact that they bombed Western Supermare. <laughs> <laughs> you know where he came from. So, uh, but that, that's a lovely one. Yeah, uh, we, the thing about when I'm looking up and talking to, I've got an elder brother, an elder sibling in Glasgow, our brand. And I'm 76 now. Our brand's a sort of, uh, I think, mid-80s now. Um, but, uh, and he would keep me right about the cook's time because obviously when you're a wee bar, Aye. you know. But the one thing I remember, Richard, isn't it funny, is hearing the Killy Moon Flute Band 
That was the local band in Cookstown coming oh. down the street when you're in your pram. It's not amazing. It really um, is, though. Yeah, I, I, you know, you can still sort of hear it. And when I went back, when the BBC Northern Ireland took us back, at John Daly, a lovely fella called John Daly, had a, an independent company called Green Inc. And he decided to take comics. He did a wee series where he took us all back, myself, Frank Carson and Roy Walker. And when we went back to Cookstown, they actually, the band reassembled. Right. And walked down the street. They played a hymn now. So right. we kept us all, everybody happy. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> but but uh, and we actually shot it outside because uh, my father, uh, my dad, uh, Frank, he actually owned a, a, a pub in Cookstown. He was uh, the local undertaker. He had an undertaking business. Yeah, would you believe? He had, and he had a taxi, a big right. taxi service. And and some on his odd spare time, if he ever got any, he was an auctioneer. Would you believe? So and, your, your daddy uh, so chauffeured he, chauffeured people in life and in death. Then <laughs> you, that's it, Richard. Really, mm -hmm. basically, he, my old man would get you somewhere if you didn't go and have a drink, or you didn't take his taxi. Uh, well, in your uh, last moments, he'd be there. And uh, uh, by well, all accounts, he was a great character. And I do tell this story. I suppose uh, I think your listeners might enjoy it that he was coming back from... If, what he did was he was a, an entrepreneur as well and he sent over to England for a Rolls Royce which he had converted into the hearse, you see, to give people a good send-off. Oh. And he was coming back from a funeral and uh, this obviously was during the war and there was three American servicemen who were based uh, near Cookstown and they were thumb on a lift so my father says, yeah, sure, boys, get in the back. Right. So after a few miles, they said, right, Mac, this is it. Let us off now. And he let them off. And one of them said, do you know, that's the bumpiest ride I've ever had. And my father said, you're the only one to get out of there that's complained. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brilliant. So it's a nice story that, that to look back, you know, I think my sister told me that one, my other sister. So how many yeah. how many brothers and sisters had you got, Jimmy? Three brothers and one sister. Uh, and what, what had happened then, um, we all decided, my father, my, my mother was called Philomena. She was a, a great lady, great character too. Um, and, and one thing my brother told me, they were doing a bit of amateur dramatics. I think they first met my mother and father. I think that's a nice, cute story that yeah. he was sort of acting and, and uh, they were both acting in some play. That's how they sort of met. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, but he headed. He wanted to head off to the big, the, the heady lights of the city of Belfast, you know, to give us all a, a, a sort of a break and, and maybe he probably felt that maybe more future for us, uh, whatever the reason. But when they all left, I was only two now. Right, so Would you, you moved, believe? You moved from Cooks to age. Belfast, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he bought a shop, being a businessman, owning the bar. They bought a, uh, what would be called a convenience store, Served everything, um, Richard, you know, and a sweetie, potato, you know, uh, just a general uh, place. And I always remember uh, coming out of the living quarters uh, and actually where the customers were, I would, I would start to sing. And I would do an impression of Al Jolson, would you believe? <laughs> Al Jolson, you down on one knee, but he had these great songs written for him. Uh, you know, when April showers, they come your way. I had this very distinctive voice. Right. And another one called Mammy, Mammy, I walk a million miles for one, for of, one your of your smiles. smiles. That's right. And he was very emotional. He, he got uh, they were very emotional. But, but he was a massive name because in, in the uh, uh, Hollywood, in the movie industry, he was in the very first talkie after right. silent movies, the Al Jolson story. It's quite famous, isn't it? Uh, and, um, yeah. So I must have obviously had the, the genes then, even a very small, to be able to hear Al Johnson on the radio and then do an impression. All I remember is I didn't hear the applause and they, I didn't, uh, uh, because my, my folks, my family were just, an arm, a hand would lean out and pull me out. Well, you back up. <laughs> before I could get me <laughs> Well, you didn't take it off a back stone. Like if your parents were under the acting a bit as well, then you obviously yes, had exactly, that. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, they were. It's it's sort of it's interesting, you know what what uh, 
how your, your folks react to things like that. And they you, probably um, did let me go right through a whole song, but maybe they thought this is business. Maybe some some customers just want to go in and buy, you know, the fangs or this some sweets and don't want to hang around. Where did you end up going to school and stuff then, uh, Jimmy? Right. Well, the trams were going there. And I got, I used to get a tram, would you believe, on, on my own when I was just, I think, four or five, six. And the, m- Mammy would give me some sweets like chocolate and then uh, put me on the tram. And the tram would, would hop down a couple of miles to Ardoin. Ardoin, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, there was the Holy Cross School, but they had a primary version called Butler Street. Right, okay. So I went to the Butler Street um, uh, School. I, I was very nervous as a kid, really. Um, and uh, uh, you know the way when you're that age, you're off the thing, you take things very serious. You know, if if the teacher says to you, no, you should have read that, or you should have did something, I would worry about it. Um, in fact, once, you know, when the tram stopped, instead of going to school, I just walked around the streets of Belfast. Can you imagine a five-year-old <laughs> Holy or six-year-old walking through? Yeah. Luckily, one of my um, friends of my parents saw me, and then they took me back home. Right. But uh, I, I, I suppose I mentioned that story. It's a big illustration because it's like life and death. Sometimes Aye. when you're small and you're nervous and you should think you should have did something, you don't want to, uh, you, your heart's scared of seeing you know, the teacher. And then did you go on to a secondary school then or anything like that? Uh, uh, This is where the sadness descended on the family uh, because um, we, what happened then, it it didn't work out in the shop, Richard. uh, And I've spoke to my, you know, my elder brother, not, not, he's sadly no longer with us, John. And and he reckoned, uh, there was a combination of factors just after the war, things were rationed, you know, and people didn't have a lot of money. And, um, you know, you, you would give credit, but sometimes, you know, people when it got to Friday to pay it, maybe they didn't have the money. But unfortunately, you if you've got the shop, you have to buy the stock and you're responsible. So it was a mixture of things like that. So it didn't really work. So what we did is then, uh, uh, but three, two, three years later, just going through it in my head now, uh, I, I would have been about seven then. We moved over to Anderson's Town, which was on the other side of Belfast, and yeah. just got a, like a semi detached house. Yes. But the sadness then came, the darkness descended then when my father died. Oh, God. We had a long move. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like in Cookstown, he would have been a, a great character, you know? Yeah. Everybody loved him, obviously. But, but by the time we got to over where we went to live in Riverdale, we'd only been there six months. When he, so the, not many people, neighbours got to know him or anything. Folks travel miles just to see him. When they do, they cheer and they clap. Then they come back. But it, it just wasn't happens to families you know yeah. it was a sad thing because the mammy was amazing Philomena was unbelievable because the, the boys were growing up now but I would still have been about uh, eight then but the brothers had started to get jobs and things usually in bars I think the boys like work to work in bars and um, my sister got to work a job in a cinema Mary but uh, uh, the mummy went out to work herself, Philomena. She was amazing. There was a Lucas Eight factory not far from where we were. Right. And she, you know, she, she was amazing because she would, she would iron everybody's shirts and things or put the washing in. And then she'd go off and do an eight hour day in the Lucas Eight. And oh, it wasn't easy, it. like, you know. Oh, incredible. Uh, uh, when you look back, you know, I mean, uh, it, there was certainly no frills. What, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you can imagine four brothers we were all characters you know keeping the, the in Anderson time where we lived all my brothers all had friends the, the, the things uh, but keep an order like they play the wee game of cards and all of the, the, the living room. <laughs> but she was very easy going I think that was the thing too what age well did you need to I, I got behind then I got behind because when a time I got to um, Mr. Trevor was very it was still loads of fields it was a very rural area and St. Teresa's school was about two miles away. And right. of course, that was packed. I couldn't get in when I got there. So there was this lull uh, when I didn't really get. Uh, and I think what might have been 
it's hard to looking back now about six months or something but that can be an awful lot when you're that age oh my god it is uh, like, yes it, uh, yes it can be quite um what uh, traumatic to enter into a school when they've moved i remember they'd moved into the alphabet and i thought what what's this alphabet oh, you know god. a yeah. b c so <laughs> you, you, you're trying to catch well, you're up. already behind you know well you are you are, and that, that was quite challenging. What the wonderful thing about the home is we all stuck together. The siblings were all great. They'd all come home from the bars and tell stories, and I would come down from, uh, I'd come down from um, bed, let me come down and listen to all their wee stories about who they'd met and all, and, and gradually the mammy then, the smile would come back to her, because it was tough, it was so, so hard, but we all, we rallied around, like all families do, don't we? It's the old accordion my father gave to me he played it in the days before we all watched tv he could play any song they called out from a reel to a waltz by strice and when he played his danny boy it always brought down the house he'd strap it to his shoulder and head off every night and I'd wave him off the doorstep till he was out of sight. Now many an accordion player can play a William Tell, but not with only one hand to drink a pint of beer as well. He play the different football things as a box. So then you decided to head off to be a, a red coat. Yes. Uh, what had happened then, my brother Brian. Uh, had met a nice girl, Gabriel, and then uh, went over to Butlins in Mosney. Uh, it's 26 miles from Dublin, actually. But he came back and he said, no, but I didn't get any exams or anything. So I was in sort of just very menial jobs. Like um, I would work in a factory over on the Armour Road in Belfast. Uh, just uh, it was a box makers, but I didn't make any boxes. I carried the boxes from the fellas that made it. I used to carry them back and forth to the yeah. bars and back and forth and think up jokes when I was <laughs> doing it. And then I got a job as a board marker, writing up the, the horses in the back that's shop. That's right, and the bookmakers, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And that was the one. It was during that time, but I, I'd always, I'd started to, you know, I had uh, aspirations to break into the, the, the showbiz. And Brian came back and said, there's a great job. Uh, I've just been to Butler and Camp and they have these uh, guys and girls called Redcoats, very outgoing people. They help people enjoy their holiday and then they can do a wee act. Most of them can either sing or dance or play an instrument. He said, now, you know, uh, you, you're in these places working, factories, and you're unhappy, obviously. You're making the best of it, but you want to get out to, to, to entertain. Uh, I think this job would be ideal for you. And I'd never been to a Butlins, you see, Richard. Right, okay. uh, but, but simply through my, my brother's um, fuel in my imagination, I just wrote off a wee letter to them. And then they uh, came back and said, well, we're, we're going to give you an interview. Uh, I mean, they said interview, but it turned out to be like an addition because I, I put a jacket <laughs> on and a, a bow tie and I bounced in. What was, your, what was your party piece at that stage? Like, uh, did you... No uh, I started off mime, and what had happened is we used to hang around a corner called Lundy's. It was a cafeteria, milky milk bar, milk uh, place. Right. And um, uh, what happened was my brothers used to uh, uh, hang around there first. In fact, uh, my brother Brad actually, would you believe, when rock and roll came out, he once played Little Richard's Tutti Frutti 15 <laughs> times in the jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> so much so that they had it fixed the jukebox so you couldn't play the same song twice. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and my other brother Kieran, he used to do. Uh, he loved to sort of the, the, getting the fish and chips, but he used brand sauce. He loved HP sauce, uh, so they started to charge. Then they put them in satchels and started to charge two D. <laughs> so, so, so your brothers should blame them. <laughs> yeah. So I would I would meet people there and we'd be chat come up from Riverdale and would meet other people. Fergie Woods was a great, great chum of mine. Uh, Fergie went to Queens and things. He was from a not obviously a more, you know, I, I was, I'm trying to suppose to explain, I would be, hadn't had any uh, education as such, but Fergus Woods was one of my best friends, but I had lots, we used to sing songs uh, on the corner. 
you know, and we'd have even special nights. Oh. So we'll do a Lonnie Donegan night, you know, at Cumberland Cat. I mean, you know, Bobby Darren, we'd all do that. And then one one night, I think this fella called uh, Ed Corr came and said, look at this Belfast Telegraph. They're doing uh, a PJ Proby competition. The, the one who can do the impression of them, the best, uh, can get win a fiver. And it's at the <laughs> Plaza Ballroom in Belfast. Uh. So, well, I wasn't too... Uh, that made the new Elvis. I could do a wee bit of that because there had been a dance hall nearby Lundy's where I'd get up and do Mick Jagger and all. They were he, he, that was very animated, but I yeah. wasn't too sure about PJ. What does he do? And then uh, one of the boys would say, Well, he wears this bow, he used to wear a Tom Jones bow and he right. wore a frilly shirt. My sister's got a frilly So, next thing you know, we're in the bus, all of us, and I'm in a frilly shirt and the, the bow in the back. <laughs> and uh, I, I want it funny enough, I want it. Because uh, in the newspaper advert, it actually said uh, to be judged by a DJ all the way from England. That was a big thing called Mad Mike. Right. So I won that. And with the fiver, we all went back to uh, to Lundy's and uh, got uh, ice cream, <laughs> Snickerbocker glories, whatever. Oh. That, yeah, that, that Lundy's then went on to become... Um, Pat and Gloria and uh, Matassi then it became the Palm Grove. Right. And I'm not sure what it would be now if it's still the Palm Grove or, or whatever, but uh, it, it, it changed uh, at that time. And, uh, but flushed with the success, Fergus Woods had this ingenious idea. He said, look, you know, man, you, you, you've got this rubbery face, Jimmy. Why don't we put uh, a lot of, snip them together with a Grundig tip different pops to a wee bit of Mick Jagger and that because there was an act at the time Richard called the Recordites right okay George and Sydney and they did these quick fire mime and lip sync until these records yes. you see uh, so we had a go at that and we went down to the Boom Boom Room which was a big dance hall there and they had a talent show and uh, I went on but the only thing what we'd done is we didn't have any idea about the discipline and having it to a certain time, it just went on about 20 minutes. Well, the, everybody just what, in the talent competition had two songs or five minutes. So once I was doing it, it overran about them. Across, <laughs> and Fergie was trying to protect the Grundig machine because the, the, the owner, the manager, was the comper. He kept pointing to his watch. They said, when's this fella coming off? <laughs> and I could, and they started wrestling to get up, gain access to the uh, the grumpy. Yeah. So I thought, back, and the next thing you know, bang, it stopped, and I'm still miming away there, going away, but there's, there's nothing coming from it. So, needless to say, that was a uh, didn't really work out. We put the Grundeck machine on our arms, we took the bus home, and we drowned our sorrows with Point another the of glory. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd started then realizing that you have to sort of um, engage with an audience. Mammon's good, but oh. you know, so I got a few gags together and there was a big thing called search for a uh, search way to the stars, stairway to the stars, right, okay. which happened at the Grove theater in Belfast. Right. And that's when I met another young comedian who would be a friend for life. Uh, he lives over here now and, uh, we keep in touch, called Adrian Walsh. Yes. Adrian was some banger. Yeah. And uh, he didn't get to the final. I managed to get to the final. I had this little gimmick uh, after I'd done some gags, was to do, I've always been very, like, physical comedy of like that. And I liked a comedian I'd seen on the London plane called Billy Dainty. Right. And Billy used to do this incredible strut, you know, with a, Leg mania, they used to call it in variety. It, it was uh, wiggly legs and that. So I would do an impression of him doing the twist. Then Norman Wisdom had a nice thing for them, I'd do an impression of him. So that was made me a wee bit different, you see. And uh, I did another talent competition at the Orchid and I got to, uh, I won the heat there. And then by that time I got the red coat. But the thing was when I got to Mosney, Richard, which I never encountered, was that I had a very obviously growing up in Belfast, you have a, a, a your accent is that it was quite broad. When I got over to Mosney, a lot of them were from the uh, Free State, the uh, Republic of the you know, um, uh, the holiday makers, and even the entertainers were all from Dublin. Things and I loved them. We all had, had a great, great, great time. But once I went on that stage, I just talked too quick. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, that was, they had a job making me out, you see. 
No problem on the 12th of July and the week after because all the people came up from <laughs> oh, Northern right, from Ireland. From Belfast. That's right. Uh, yeah. That's that, amazing. They, they were the times when I did the best on the show, but at least it, it, uh, it, I, I worked on it a bit. God, it was all the learning curve, wasn't it? I, exactly. Exactly. Because when I went over to England, I had to start working even more on it, you see, yeah, because right. that's the thing. It's communication, isn't it? You know, and if they don't get what you hear, you could be the funniest person in the world, but uh, you're not going to get a laugh at the end. <laughs> Oh, it's great to be here. I know I'm here because I'm not over there. <laughs> I've just had some acupuncture, but I didn't mean to. I put a new shirt on, forgot to take the pins out. <laughs> I went to the doctor last week. I said, doctor, last week, come here. <laughs> I think my eyesight's failing. He said, it's gone completely. This is the laundrette. <laughs> How did you end up going to England? Well, when I came back from Mosney, um... That's the only thing about a seasonal job. You have the time of your life. And I did at Mosney because I had one day off a week and I used to jump on the train. The train stopped right outside. The train from Belfast to Dublin stopped right outside the camp, you know? Uh, I know. Even with the pitch and, uh, the pitch and put. <laughs> I was amazed there was more windows and the train weren't broken okay. because <laughs> it came right up to the track. My God. Literally. And uh, so you got off the station and the people that would come, uh, would their bags um, would be taken up, and but right to the chalet. It wasn't, you know, it was only five minutes. So I used to jump on the train, come home some some weeks, you see, yeah. the mammy. Yeah, I, five, five, it, six quid a week. Your wages were six quid a week, but it was all fine because you had your three meals a day and you had your, your bed, you know, even if if you were uh, wanted a, a drink. Well, the campers, as they call them, they'd all buy red coats. You wouldn't even have to buy that. So I, I would come home and I was able to give the mummy a fiver out of the six pound, to be honest. Mm, brilliant. And then jump in the, the train. But then when it gets to September, it's all, it grinds to a halt. Just stop you suddenly. It's going to yeah. be like it forever, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and then I realized, well, what do I do now? You know, if, if you want to, you know, earn a living is. <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's the place, I suppose. Yeah. What, what the old saying, if you want to paint ceilings, you've got to hang around with a Pope. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the Michelangelo syndrome. Uh, you've got to get over there. And of course, yeah. your problems just start when you arrive there because obviously what had happened was that my brother had given me an address. To, everybody was fixated with London then. Uh, my brother Brian, my brother John, they said, now you'll get the, the, the boat from Belfast, and then you'll arrive in Hesham, and then you get this train then to Euston. But nobody ever said, well, you've got Liverpool and Manchester there. That, that. As and at well, the time, yeah. they were the places that had all the clubs, that all the working men's clubs and all the places. But we didn't know that at the time. As you say, everything's a learning curve. Oh. So I headed for London, you know? And... Uh, I had an address of a friend, my brother, and uh, obviously when I got there, he was working in the barn. It was tough for him. He was just about making ends meet, and I thought, I'm in the way here. But luckily, my brother had given me uh, a B plan. He said, if things don't work out, Jim, he said, Camden Town in London has got an Irish centre run by nuns. So get yourself over to there and then they'll make sure you get grub and they'll you're, you're you looked know, after. You, yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly what I did. I made my way through the uh, teeming metropolis uh, on the underground, making my way through Camden on my own. Bloody it's crazy hell. in a way. And what age were what age me then? Uh twenty one. Twenty one, right, okay. Yeah. Young man in a big town, hey. It was. It was actually, yeah. 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 And and did you go straight into the entertainment business then, or were you? Well, like, my, my other next jobs? link then, I took the day jobs. I worked in a jam factory actually. Uh, what had happened when I arrived at the Irish Centre? There was a fellow there from Belfast. Well, you actually start you you you're, you're get attracted to people from home, don't you? Yeah. And he said, "I'm thumbing my way up the the leads." He said, "Do you want to come with me?" Now it was a crazy notion because I just come all the way to London. But I did it. You do things like that. So next thing, we're thumbing a lift up the M1. We're back up to Leeds. And uh, then it turned out he he actually had a, a family, so he didn't hang around. So I was still in the digs. 
So I got a, a, a job, a temporary job at a jam factory leading up to Christmas. But by that time, the homesickness <laughs> blues had really dug in and I was really wanting to go home at Christmas, you see. And so that's when I, uh, I came home. And then I took a deep breath and when the January came, said goodbye to the family, I thought I'm going to have another go. You know? It always reminds me of Georgie Best, the great George, you know, when he was, he was playing. He came over and he, he just, it, he got so homesick. But Matt Busby hung on in. He rang his father and he said, look, I'll get him a nice digs with a nice lamp lady and, it, and, and he can be happy there. And of course, the rest is history, really. Yeah, but course, on yeah. those little things, it hinges, doesn't it? And then I rang up the optician. He's no good. He told me he couldn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I turned up at his office. He said, have your eyes ever been checked? I said, no, they've always been this color. <laughs> so when did you come up with the Jimmy Cricket? Right. Well, uh, just basically, when I went back the second time, I got transferred over to the red coat of the Caps in England. So uh, that was really when I started to work on, on my act. There was a wonderful man called Bill Martin, who'd been in Twice Nightly Variety. And when all the theatres closed, he took a job as an entertainment manager. But he, he helped me in the, in the show with the sketches and gave me things. And then after a couple of years in, in Redcoat, uh, Fred Parton had started Pontons. So then I went to the one in Pontons, the, yeah. the Markham one, uh, Middleton Towers. And that's when I was there as a blue coat, which is pretty much similar to Redcoat. Three young ladies came over from Belfast on the yes. Haitian boat to work as waitresses. Yes, yes. And uh, two of them, actually, their mommy had taught them to sing, so they used to get up at the bar after they'd laid the tables. And that was the, the Tweedy sisters, and one of them made Tweedy then. I fell in love with it, and then I sort of, uh, we, we got together when the season finished, and we went to Manchester, and it was, it was that time when I was trying everything, going on places, and I remember one agent saying to me, Jimmy, do you think it's just a wee bit Mulgrew, they can't, you know, is it a wee bit too Irish or is it a, is it a, 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 for a concert secretaries? These were the people who were in clubs, concert secretaries. Uh, the cabaret uh, clubs had compers, but the concert secretaries were the, the guys from the committee who'd, who'd book you and um, they would ring the wee bell at the back or whatever it was. They would bring you on and, and uh, they had a job saying, uh, Jimmy Mull, Mull, Mull. So, and then I thought, well, I always liked the, the, the Jiminy Cricket, you know, the Walt Disney and things like yeah, that. So if yes. I thought, I'll keep my real first name, Jimmy, I will do cricket. And uh, that's how that came about. Jimmy Cricket was born, eh? Exactly, yeah. I'll never forget, it was a place called the PCM Club in Sale, which is Cheshire, which is the other side of Manchester. We're in Rochdale here. And i uh, been toying with the idea. And when the fella, what had happened, the Tweedy sisters, my wife and her sister were very popular in the clubs, I got them work. They did nice things like, there you go, and a bit of Simon and Garfunkel. It wasn't a hard act to, 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 to sell, and people loved it, you see. Yes. But I was still trying to get a style and a character. So uh, they, they had music written uh, when they were at the holiday camp. There was a band on called The Nobodies, and Cass had written about uh, 12 songs. Because all the clubs uh, in the north of England in those days we're talking about the uh, early 70s, all had live musicians, usually a duo, a keyboard and a drummer. So you actually had dots physically, you know, and this, this cast had written them. So they had two spots of six songs each. But when they got to the PCM club, the fellow wanted three spots. He wanted his money's worth. So I said, well, I'll, I'll go on and do, uh, you know, a bit of comedy. And he said, well, what's your name? And then bang, that's when I said, Jimmy Cricket. And... Uh, that's and, and, how that came about. about that that Mez's uh, sister Margaret had met a, a nice fella uh, uh, in the camp as well in Middleton Towers called Graham. Graham Tennant uh, was lovely. He was from Leeds and he'd been there with his parents and, and he was a student, but he went on to be a teacher. So he'd come over, he used to drive over, but Leeds is only half an hour, 40 minutes across the Pennines, Richard. So yes. he used to come over and, and drive. We, we didn't have a driver, you see, so... Uh, and I remember he said to me, when I told the fellow it was Jimmy Cricket, and he walked away, Graham said, that must be a funny name. He's just laughed. So, uh, <laughs> In terms of just going from Jimmy Cricket, the pretty unknown 
comedian to yes. the name that you became. Was that a yes. rapid process or what would you oh no you it that to anything in particular? Yeah, it took about eight years doing every club in the land. That there is a defining story when I went to Liverpool in between these times, and because I knew that Frank had, had made it. Frank had, was a name by then, Frank Carson. Yeah. Um, I knew he had an agent in Liverpool called Ernie Mack. So I, I took the ball by the horns and I went into Ernie's office and I said, Can you, you know, get me work, do something and things? And uh, Ernie was a real character. He'd, uh, he'd been a prisoner of war and uh, this American musician had taught him to play the banjo. And he had a band in Liverpool called the Saturated Seven. Uh, but he was also a very uh, intuitive uh, showman and entrepreneur. And he actually uh, uh, built, what would be the word, uh, he um, engineered or bought uh, three different clubs in Liverpool. One was right. called the Broadway Club. Yeah. The other was called the Montrose Club. And uh, he became an agent. So he would buy acts... Yeah, and they would play the Montrose Club for three nights. They'd play the uh, Broadway. And then he had Jacobs, Cream Crackers, had a social club. So you could do a complete week uh, for an artist, would do a complete week for Ernie. And uh, so I went to his office and he says to me, I tell, I'll tell you what I'll do, uh, Jimmy. Uh, you've just come over from Ireland. I'll put Frank Carson on the phone. And of course, I had this great conversation with Frank. Ah, Ernie Watts uh, says, um, you want to be a comedian, <laughs> right? Work every night. Ah, uh, all right, Frank. Is it? Yeah. Uh, even if it's for nothing, uh, because you're getting experience and you learn how to put a gag, a gag in here and a word in and leave a word out. It was like a master class, actually. That phone call. That's when I look back on hindsight. Yeah. That's precious. And, uh, and it finished by it was a lovely fit. I said, "Well, thank experience." And he went, "It's not advice you want. It's money." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, the, two, the two nuggets of that was get as much experience as you can and earn as much money as you can, eh? Well, that, that, exactly. That, that was Frank's thing. He was absolutely bang on on that Aye. work and everything because once you started, once, and I must thank my good lady for that because I was just doing weekends and trying to earn a crust and she said, look, I'll, I'll work. I've got the job in the Potato Crisp factory in Cheadle Hume and you can then rehearse and practice through the day and you won't, because, you know, when you're working in factories, you know, you work eight hours, you come home, you're oh, not, you don't feel the mood to rehearse think, really. or start yeah. right. Yeah. So that, that was a, when I look at it, it was a, a wonderful uh, stroke of generosity from my good lady to actually then be yeah. the breadwinner. Yeah. Which Fair meant play. I could concentrate. Yeah. And then I, I broke in with a local agent. He said to me, right, uh, we can do business together. Uh, here's a week's work, the first week's work. And it was with a, a, a comedy show group called The Grumbleweeds. Yeah. Uh, the Grumbleweeds uh, were like a couple of acts in those days. Uh, another one was Ronnie Jukes and Ricky Lee, whereby they were never on television. But because there was so much of a club industry yeah. and people went out to clubs, they made a name for themselves. Uh, it was probably like home show bands, you know, the Royal Show Band. People would queue up to see the Royal. The Clipper Cart were the first big yes, show that's band. Right. My brothers used to tell me about that's them. That's right. And, yep. and you couldn't get a ticket. And it, that, pretty much that was the same in, the, in Northern clubs. Over here, people, thing like the Grumbleweed. So uh, this complete week, the, we played a place called the Gary Club in Lee in Lancashire, not far from Wigan. And uh, in fact, this Lee, Joe Dolan used to come over with his, with his uh, band and... Uh, and Joe would fill it for a week as well. Is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah um, just that was a sort of a, I just thought about that myself. That was a, the sort of a link with, with the film there as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that would do. But the, the other next week he gave me was down in South Wales in Swansea. Now, right. we're here in the north of England, Manchester. That's quite a, quite a, and I didn't have a That's car right. when I first became a professional. So you had to just bust up and train us? <laughs> I did, but it was a train strike. Oh. So I, got, <laughs> I, I can't, I'll never forget it, uh, Richard. So how did you manage? Week, well, I got a, the bus, the coach. Right. Took about seven hours. But when I got down to Swansea and went round to the, the guest house where the agent had recommended, then my luck turned for the better. Right. Because the lady, the landlady said to me, right, she said, Alan Phillips, the agent's been on. 
uh, he said at half seven, a car will pick you up because there's two girls next door called Touch of Velvet and you're doing the whole week, different clubs with them, but they've got this uh, driver. Uh, uh, so you'll sit in the car. How lucky is that? Oh, the whole week, this fellow used to pick me up in a car with the girls in next door because it would have been a logistic nightmare to try and get buses to all the clubs around. Oh, it would have been a nightmare. Yeah. Oh. Getting home would have been a nightmare. Never mind getting there. <laughs> You know, I, don't know how did it. I don't I'm know sure how the bus is stopped at some stage. Yeah, <laughs> but but you know, you, 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 what what did they say? Um, Fortune favors the brave. Is that what what is that yeah, well, have to go and they, please God, and, they all work out. You know, and like it, it was hard work, Jimmy. Oh, absolutely, it was. It was that my what had happened. Uh, the little things I drew on from the letter from the mammy was uh frank had, had did that first now to be honest but the comic i'd seen do it at butlins when i was a red coat was billy stuck right. and uh you know it's always good a uh, a uh, 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 a thing from home ladies and gentlemen i got a letter from my mommy this morning she said dear son your father gets worse as he gets older yesterday he was releasing one of his pigeons and the sleeve of his jacket caught on its claw He rang me this morning to say that the Isle of Wight is a very nice place. <laughs> and he hopes to be home the day after tomorrow. He's going to have his ingrowing toenail seen to. It's pushing his wig off. <laughs> Your father was watching Masterman the other night and he got very pleased with himself. He can now say Magnus Magnuson. <laughs> Yeah, you're always going to get that. The thing about which I, with uh, the letter, you always keep it up to date. Now, yeah. what I would do when I would say, uh, the whole, it was my birthday, son, last Wednesday, and the whole family bought me a flat screen television set. I don't like it. My ornaments keep slipping off the top. See, so <laughs> you're, you're always, and, and that was it. So that would always, even if I was struggling with an audience, you know, Richard, uh. I can, get a bit of a tickle with that because it was slow too yeah that always but, helps but also it's like the, the concept delivery. of a letter from your mommy would yes, have been a big I, thing in those days you know people yes, coming abroad you know absolutely uh, the other thing i did was being a visual comic i did a sort of a cod strip where i would take my jacket and uh shirt and i'd have a vest full of holes and then I, once I'd, I'd, I'd taken my pants down, I'd have these big long shorts, right? Okay. Uh, khaki shorts. But it meant I could put a, a, a safari hat on, <laughs> and, you know, and do lots of props and things. So, yeah. so that was always the second half was always visual, and then I would do um, little like tap dance and stock and feet and things. Well, no, King of the Swingers was a nice number for me. I used to do a boom, boom, boom. You, you could be animated with that one as well. Yeah. So they were the things that, that I put into the act in those days, you know. And did you work in your own script or did people help you with it? Like, how did that evolve? I, I think it was just you and the audience, basically. What they liked, you would say, you would come off and say, I'll keep that in. I what they didn't that. like, bang, that would get the elbow. I, I, no, I think I think your friendship is with the audience and That's letting amazing, them be the it? barometer, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, and, and you see in the... the I like, mean, Bill Martin, as I'm sorry, Richard, uh, Bill Martin right. obviously said character comedies for you. He said, you know, look, listen. And, th and that way I was getting... Uh, well, but I think for everybody, you have to go out and, 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 and do it. It's a trial. People say trial and error, but it's trial and success, really, isn't it? The Saturday Night Show, you've done that for several years. Like That yes. must have been a fairly big commitment in terms of pulling that together every week. Yes. Well, uh, basically, what had happened uh, for the, the garb to come, I, I decided to, to, to be you know visually funny. Originally, when I did the, the talent competition uh, on television, it was called Search for a Star. I had yeah. a white jacket and uh, trousers at half mast and a pair of wet water boots. Yeah. Uh, when I got the uh, this good old day show, it came from Leeds, and they wanted you to be in Edwardian garb. They dressed the audience even up in uh, Victorian stroke Edwardian clothes. So they were the ones that gave me the hat and the tail coat. And I I'd, uh, got myself a manager in London. A lady had rang one one day to say uh, she looked after Rod Holland Emu. I don't know if you remember Rod Holland Emu. I heard, of course, Jeekers. Uh, which was, yeah, yeah. The, the wee thing, the wee the bird. prop on his arm yeah. and things. Yeah. It was great, yeah. Uh, 
and she said, I've heard you're a clean act. She said, uh, would you like to do a, a show with um, Rod? I couldn't do that at the time because I, I was already sort of committed, but she, she kept an eye. She was good. It's one of those television con conversations or telephone conversations when you sort of hit it off with somebody. She was quite polite. She yes. was called Phyllis Rounds. Well, I was going to ask you about Phyllis Rounds because I think she played a big enough part in your career, didn't she? She was the one then. I think she she really turned it around because she was the one that once I'd done the good old days, I did the Christmas thing, and she said, if we could get that uh, gear from them, uh, the attire, yes. buy it from the BBC, then you 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 know you'll have your um, identification, your your uh, clothes. Well, yeah, like Charlie Chaplin has almost, his bowler yeah. hat, and Norman Wisdom has his we uh, the, the gump. Jacket. Yeah, it would have been your signature tune, really, wouldn't it? Oh, and that, that's a lovely phrase, look. actually. That's yeah. a perfect phrase, um, Richard, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Well, basically, the BBC had hired it out from a London costumeers called Bermans and Nathans, but they said, here's the number. So we <laughs> rang them, and they said, we'll, get, we'll sell it to you for 60 quid. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> hey, that's amazing. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, you have to repair it and things, so we had to get a... a, a, a a new one then especially made and that was a lot more really than that but it's just interesting but because phyllis had the uh creative vision you see she was a character because she was a captain uh in the second world war um and in those days that was talk about the glass ceiling you know uh, guys saluting to uh, ladies then was, was quite a different those different attitudes yeah. but there was a colonel there called colleague alexander and they arrived in london and with a typewriter, uh, that was only a bit of furniture they had. <laughs> but they they managed these acts like uh, Charlie Drake, Terry Thomas, and David Nixon. And then Phyllis went on to manage uh, Ralph Harris, um, Rod Holland, Emu. Tony Hancock was the big one for Phyllis. Yeah, yes. Tony Hancock was Absolutely. amazing, the amazing. one for Phyllis. Massive. Yeah. She was just special because you could be doing a pantomime, Richard, and she'd sit at the very back when you were doing the rehearsals. Um, and then she'd come around when the rehearsals are finished and, and she'd say, darling, we couldn't hear that word when you came on and did that. You know, you have to pronounce that a you know, clearer for the yeah. audience. I mean, that, that's going the extra mile. That does. It really is. Somebody, uh, I mean, that's like a coach for a tennis player, really, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it, it is. And that's, you need that. You need that sort of... You do, critical... because you don't, because you, it's, you get into habits. <laughs> your granddad is now 85 years of age the first thing he does in the morning is read the newspaper he looks at the deaths column in bed and if his name isn't in it he gets up <laughs> we've had a spate of deaths in the village son there's people dying now that never died before Two weeks ago, the local librarian died. As a mark of respect, we all got up and made noise for a whole minute. <laughs> There's household names. You performed with some famous people like Lionel Blair and others over the years. And I'm sure you went and toured with quite a few people too. Because when I was talking to you last week, Jimmy, you're talking about Jerry and the Pissmakers, for example. Like yes. people that are still, you know, today our icons yeah. of music and the entertainment world. Yes, I, I worked a few times with Jerry. Um, Jerry loved working live, you see. I mean, um, from the original Pacemakers, he had a brother who was very good, uh, but his brother left and the original uh, Pacemakers. But he he loved it, so he had a passion, so he, there'd be different Pacemakers come in to help him. So I remember doing a week in Hull with him uh, when I was supporting them and I used to go around into the dressing room and have a wee chat with them, you know, Sky Cern and Irishman, it was all, we, we had a lot of fun. There was another thing called the Hamilton uh, Club in um, Birkenhead. And then I did reach within the last three or four years now, he, he wasn't all that well, but he was still uh, whacking out, you'll never walk alone. And that was over in Benidorm at the Palace Yeah, in Benidorm. And I just, would you believe, my good lady read out something to me last night she'd read on social media that, you know, Ferry Across the Mersey. Yes. Uh, he wrote that himself. And oh. it, it, it's the actual boat that goes from Liverpool across to Wallasey and Birkenhead. Ferry Across the Mersey oh, is the place. Song. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they still play it now, even though he, obviously he, uh, he's left it, God rest his soul. But they're not actually going to name the terminal the Jerry Marsden terminal. Oh, it's not amazing, isn't it? Yeah, which is a great, great tribute to him. Yeah. He writes some classics, really. You know, like, <coughs> like any songwriter would be uh, uh, delighted to get one sort of iconic hit. hit yeah. Of- you know, Jerry and the pacemaker certainly had his more than his fair share. Like there's two songs you get named right away that he yeah. that you'll yeah. never walk alone, for example, and uh, and yes. that one, you know, Ferry Cross and Mercy, that were just massive hits, weren't they? And you were good friends with him, which is incredible. Yeah, well, the, the and the other two big hits were I like it and How do you do it? And they yeah. were written by a guy called Mitch Murray. Uh, and I remember once going over to do a show in the Isle of uh, Man where Mitch Murray lived. And the taxi driver said to me, oh, how you doing? Did it, you know, Mitch Murray lives here, he said. And I said, oh, man, did all the hits. I uh, wrote for Jerry. and the, But he also wrote um, Billy, Don't Be a Hero. Uh, was it? Uh, Paperless. Paperless, that's yeah. right. Oh, and the other one family. that Tony Christie did, I did what I did for Maria. For Maria but but yeah. actually, in those instances, uh, Mitch wrote the music. Uh, it was another guy called Peter Callender wrote the lyrics for those. And that, um, I think he did that other great Tony Christie, Alloways and Avenues. Anyway, this taxi driver said, yeah, he, he was in the taxi and he's given me this um, the CD with all his hits on it. <laughs> uh, so he said, uh, I'll get him on the phone. This taxi driver got Mitch Murray on the phone as we were driving, you know, please pick me up from the ferry. And I said, oh, hello, Mitch. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, give me your address. He said, I'll send you off a CD as well. <laughs> <laughs> so he sent me of all his hits. But I must, uh, speaking of uh, one song, I, mean, I used to uh, get a laugh from Jerry on this. I said to him when I was working with him once, I said, you know, Jerry, uh, is it true that, uh, you know, a newspaper uh, didn't do a very good article and you were a wee bit ups- upset and you wrote a song about it? And he said, what's that, Jimmy? And I said, don't let the sun catch you crying. Well, of course, that was one of his, it wasn't one of the bigger hits, but he wrote a song called Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying. Well, I might have done it for the audience that night because all the audience were his fans. Yes. And I think I did it as well for them, you know. Lena Savaroni. Yeah, yeah, loved her, loved her uh, to bits. Um, yeah, we did a summer in Torquay and, um, at the Princess and you know she was obviously quiet and shy but what a performer yeah. you know she had this what a set of tonsils you know yeah uh, i uh i remember you know seeing her now i could see then jimmy right and i remember seeing her in opportunity Knox, and she was only yeah. a, a young girl but she must have been about nine or ten or eleven years of age i don't know what age she was but she was roughly my age let's say but uh, yeah. a young girl on opportunity now, that's she could have been 13 or 14, but it seemed yeah. to me that she was that age when she was an opportunity knocks. And my brothers, you know, I come from a big family, right? There's uh, nine boys and three girls in our house, and I was the second youngest. So my brothers, every time that Lena Savaroni appeared on Opportunity Knocks, my brothers used to say to me, Hey, your girlfriend. So, <laughs> so and I used to get all embarrassed. So every, after that, when she appeared, I used to hide in the back hall until she was over. So, really? So they couldn't slag me. <laughs> Aye, that's a fact, and that's what I remember about Lena Savaroni. Other than the song, "Ma," you know, "Mama, he's kissing me," or you know that. Um, yeah. Well, the thing about you know uh, Lena, you see, she was such a, a great dancer and mover as well. She could sell the song. Yeah. That yeah, that, that was the thing, you know. Yeah. She she belted it out. Uh, she had the the, the the pipes, but she also she was a great mover as well, and. Uh, there is a sort of a fan club on social media and sometimes you'll see stuff on YouTube where uh, she's working in America with Frank Sinatra and she's on the Johnny Carson Tonight Show. You know, I mean, they they recognise the talent that she had. Oh, my God. Hi. You know? Exactly right. And another character that you, iconic figure of that era that you ended up uh, performing with was Basil Brush. Yes. Uh, it never, it, yeah. it, did it, am I right in assuming it didn't make the cut because of some audience problem or something? No, when I, um, in the 80s, there was still industrial unrest, you right. see. Um, and uh, basically that was going to be the first show of um, 
for the first series of that. And there's more was what it was titled. Uh, we did it from 1985 to 1988. We had four sort of seasons of it. But the very first one, and uh, the electricians called a strike with about a couple of hours to go. And uh, the producer at the time, Tony Wolf, said, he said, look, some of the people have arrived, Jimmy, in the green room, the audience. Would you go and explain the situation to them? You know, that it's not proper lighting and things like that. Or, and, and, uh, and I went, had a wee chat with them and said, we appreciate you coming. But, you know, it's it's not going to happen tonight. Yeah. But then when I went back to uh, the guy that run, he was the original innovator of Basel. Uh, it was a guy called uh, Ivan. I'm trying to think of a surname now. It's not Ivan Black, because Ivan Black is a keyboard player over at home. Yeah. I've done some shows with. Uh, but he was called Ivan anyway. And we sort of sat in his dress and we said, do you want to have a go at it anyway? So we actually did it in an empty studio oh, with, with just the cameraman. And you can't expect the cameraman to laugh because they're looking at the script and they know when they have to they know turn their cameras at that. Yeah. So they're concentrating. Yeah, they'll never you know, on what yeah. they have to do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. And I think that's why it never made the final cut. I think, uh, Tony, it, it's awful hard for a producer to make a snap decision because yeah. he doesn't know how it went. Yeah. There was no oh. feedback, you see. Uh, I often uh, sort of, you know, I mean, I don't regret it's not, not a thing for any of us to do, but uh, sometimes uh, the two things I would have thought was maybe we should have in another show showed it into the monitor to the audience, then we could have got feedback. Am I right to say when you brought out a single or that only tree, is it? Well, it was on a wee album of like when a third of things quietened down a bit with the television and uh, the reality shows came in, which it didn't really, uh, but it's not something I, I was really interested in. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I obviously, if, if you being creative, I enjoyed like, writing these songs and things. And, uh, and there's one, for instance, I, the first one I did was uh, uh, album CD was I'm Dreaming of a Far Off Land. And I wanted to sort of uh, have a mixture of wee comedy songs like, uh, Lenehan's Lazy Hen about a wee chicken that won't yeah. lay eggs. <laughs> and then once extolling the virtue, you know, uh, cruising through Cush and all and that. But I've, I've always been fascinated by John John Hume and, and how um, you can sort of tr change hearts and minds and, and try and help people to live together when he always said b between sort of um, Catholics, Protestants, not uh, loyalist Republicans. If you said, "Look, uh, let's celebrate the difference," and he, uh, he he had that lovely phrase. I think uh, you probably know more about this than, than I will, um, yeah. Richard. I just love that. And I wrote a wee song called "Let's Celebrate the Difference," and yeah. uh, I sent it to him, and he, he enjoyed it. And that was part of that album as well. Let's celebrate the difference between us. between us when we try and understand we all have our own uniqueness like the instruments in a band so let's celebrate the difference between us and there'll be peace throughout the land there's so many different cultures with whom we share and your first uh, DVD was was prompted by a, a, a builder, wasn't it? Some, that's right. Some that's guy right. in a, a working. Into the garage. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> he said, he said, if you've upset somebody, and I said, uh, upset somebody. He said, somebody up high up on TV. Is that why you're not on? And you know, I suppose you don't want to sort of start explaining things. Well, <laughs> things have changed. Times have changed. There's not a show. You just go to the garage. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I said, uh, sometimes I think if I brought him in for a cup of tea and that, but he did put a notion in my head, really, of, of doing my own DVD. And, and that's exactly how I heard a wee theater. I rang around all my friends. I said, if you want to buy a ticket for me, you know, because, you know, you do charities yourself, you help them. Absolutely. So it's Absolutely. payback in a way, yeah. Richard. Yeah. And I said, but what I'll do is once, if, if it's not for me, it's once I pair all the cameras, uh, the company, the four cameras and things, what's left over, we'll bring it to the um, Spring Hill Hospice in Rochdale. And yeah. I, I was able to give them two grand anyway as well. Oh, quite a lot of money I as well. Myself, yeah. yeah. 
and uh, and I always said I wanted to sell 10,000 of them and I got to 9,000 and the pandemic hit so I probably want to hit my target only yeah. obviously the last couple of years And how did you manage during the lockdown, Jimmy? I, when it first came out, I started to do a wee joke every day. Uh, my good lady is quite good on social networking, so I thought I'll, I'll do a wee joke uh, that, that we'd film it uh, and we'd, we'd put it out every day. And it was only meant to be about, you know, 20 or 30, but uh, somebody came on and said, Jimmy, why don't you go for the 100? Right, so okay. Said, why not? So when the lockdown started in March, and by the time I got to July, I, I, I started to build a wee bit of an audience. You had the hundred. So that got yeah. me the hundred. And the other thing was um, that I'd written a play about uh, uh, a double act, uh, getting on in years, and they're in summer season and they end up here. And because they're not doing great business, they decide one decides to get another job, and the other one wants to carry on. But whatever way it. it, it, it that's their last night. The play was set in their last night and I got it on in a couple of theatres around here and then I took it on the road and then, of course, the pandemic hit again. Yeah. But what I did was I wrote a four-part uh, podcast series of half hour, what happens when they get back again. Right, and they okay. get a young agent, a young girl agent says, oh, you, you can't buy experience like that. I'm going to manage you and things. And so she, that was the, the gist of the pilot. And then... Uh, the pandemic hit, so it's how they appeared. They appeared in somebody's garden one week. <laughs> then they were outside a care home another one. I tried to make it up to date. So I've got that. That's my next thing. I've been sort of pushing that a bit. But I, between you and me and the Get Post, I, I haven't uh, obviously had the success of getting it away. But as you know, Richard, you can do it yourself then. So it looks like in the next few months, we'll I'll, I'll get that out myself up. Uh, there's a little parish hall where I try new stuff in, and then there's yeah. another little theatre that puts uh, put the play on for me, so I can actually get a live audience. That's fantastic. And get it out. Yeah. Oh, well, that'll be. Br I'll be. I look forward to that, Jimmy. Yeah. For yeah. that, um, well, it took me through the first uh, year of the thing, and now the autobiography now is the thing that's taken me through this year. So, well, since last year, I've been. And when are you planning to get the Funny thing is, here, Jimmy. Well, you know, um, I've got one publisher interested, but um, what I'm going to do is get another few. And I'd love it to be out this Christmas. That'd but, be brilliant. Right, yeah. I've got, basically, uh, my wife, uh, for Christmas, she bought me uh, Michael McIntyre, you know. Yeah. I think Michael, very good. He's he obviously a very physical and good comic. And uh, But his autobiography went up to 25 chapters. And I said, well, look, uh, I've, I've already done 28 chapters. And, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm still... I'm, what, three quarters way through? And she says, aye, but he's only 40, you're 76. <laughs> uh, well, that's true. You have twice as much to talk about, at least. Yeah. And the other thing is, I read Ronald Reagan's last year, and I right. picked him up, but he's got, is it 85 chapters? And uh, she said, yeah, but he had two jobs. <laughs> he was an actor, he was the president <laughs> for two terms. So somewhere in between, I think I'll go for, I think, about 40 chapters. Fix the wheel on Molly Malone's wheelbarrow A fine upstanding lady and as dainty as a sparrow Some kids got up to mischief and they shot her with a bow and arrow But I fixed the wheel on Molly Malone's wheelbarrow In Dublin time in the month of May while In the middle of all of that fame and fortune and working hard to become a comedian You, you and me you brought a family into the world that was the thing and that that's the thing that gives you the utmost satisfaction you know yeah you sometimes uh, can recriminate yourself a wee bit that uh you weren't there more for them but uh obviously they they uh appreciate um that you were 
obviously earning a crust and you were able to put put them through private schools and things they, yeah. they, they, they that was the thing that we put them to a convent first because when, when we were taking them on the road a, a couple fell you know we had obviously dale the eldest boy now he he's he's wonderful he he um he looked after me now he managed me for about 20 years and he got a lovely job in a local hospice berry hospice yeah. it's only about 20 minutes from here so he cycles to work in the morning so he's he's built a nice thing then uh, my next boy, um, uh, Frank, uh, he became uh, a Catholic priest. He's a parish priest in Salford. Yes. Uh, we went down yesterday uh, because he we all caught COVID, actually. But we spoke to us through, through the window. We brought him a Costco coffee and uh, sandwich and everything. Yeah. Uh, then I have a nice uh, daughter, Jamie. She's out in um, Florida. And then the younger one, Katie, uh, she uh, writes. Well, she's got two kids because so, so yeah, that's important for her. But she wrote a play. Too, she won a she? yeah, promising playwright about five or six years ago, yeah. and she had a play put on in Liverpool, which was great, uh, Richard. You know, so they've all yeah, they've all done as you say. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the first time I met you, Jimmy, was your your son Frank. Obviously, as a parish priest, brought me over to speak at a thing, and then. Uh, I was sitting in the back or in the green room or whatever it is, out like the back of the hall where I was to go up yeah. with a number of speakers that day and I was to go up to speak as well and, and walks Jimmy Cricket. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. believe it. Stage, I didn't know that Frank right. was your son. I didn't know and, that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think and, you did a great job that day. They, they, it was great. They were Northern Catholic conferences and they, they used to, some wonderful people came over. They were very uplifting and very inspirational weekends. Yeah, I was very proud of him. He, he did those, you know. Well, Jimmy, Obviously, the parish work took over, so he couldn't get involved as much then. Yeah, I think by then had he come out of seminar. I think he was just a curate then. He might have or been, maybe. Uh, yeah, so he had more time, you see, to devote. Yeah, but it's a full time job. But he's got a real job stuff. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, he misses them. They were great there, you know. In fact, there was a wonderful uh, uh, little uh, priest from Liverpool called Father Jimmy. And uh, he he was helped Frank a lot in the very first. He was wonderful uh, for healing um, people. He was a great little priest, and he was uh, friends with George Harrison's mum and dad. Yeah, actually, yeah, they're uh, uh, pals of uh, from George the Beatle. Their mum and dad were friends of Father Jimmy. But then, who I don't think there's many people in Liverpool that didn't know Father Jimmy. You know, you do a lot of charity work as well, uh, Jim. And I wouldn't like to let you go without hearing a wee bit about that. And and you were also made a Papal Knight. It must have been quite an honour to receive that recognition. Yeah, yeah, the local priest brought it round, actually, uh, Father Joe. He's retired now, he's moved to another parish, parish to a place called Whitefield uh, in Lancashire, which is down the road near Bury and between Bury and Rochdale. Yeah, he was great, and then we had a mass at, at the St. Patrick's and things. Um, Don McLean, the comedian, because uh, he has a papal knighthood as well, he came up. And uh, Dr. David Alton, or Lord Alton, yes, he was lovely. He came to the service because you, you, he was like a, a, a band, what's the word, a champion, or you have somebody sponsor you in that. Yeah, sponsor, yeah it was sponsor. lovely, and we had the choir from the local St. Patrick's uh, School. That was a great, wonderful uh, time. And I had obviously a lot of family came over from um, home uh, uh, in Northern Ireland. So that's yeah, amazing. yeah, no, I'm, I'm very I'm, proud of that. It sits, uh, it's in Latin. They, they put you, you, you get the certificate. Uh, my wife's framed it, and it's in sort of Latin. Uh, 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 James Mulgrew, Jacob James Mul and Mulgrew, and it's signed by Pope Francis. So well, you couldn't ask for any more on behalf. Oh. I think it was a cardinal on behalf of Pope Francis. Oh, that's amazing, isn't so, it? Uh, and you're involved with a number of charities, aren't you, Jimmy? Yeah. Uh, well, Francis House uh, is over in Didsbury, in Manchester, not far, and uh, they uh, obviously cure for um, children um, who need the palliative care, you know, and mm. uh, they uh, have uh, bedrooms for parents. And there's some, uh, it can be a call and say they can, call, they can actually live in it or else so they, they can, you know, uh, make visits, be, be like a day center. It, it's, it's a culminative effort, but it, it just does lovely work. And through a, a local, a uh, guy here called Jim Nicholas. He lives over in Swinton. He's a bit of a yeah. character now. He um, he does an Elvis tribute and he does nights for Cliff Richard. He lo loves 60s music. So uh, he goes around the parish halls and if they want to put a show on, either 
if, if there's something they need, like a roof or anything needs repair, we'll do it for them. But and if not, uh, we ask them, do, do they want to do a, a, France, a show for Francis House? And most of them do. And uh, we do them through the year. And it's really one. And it, it's good for the, the, the churches themselves, the parishes, because it's it's yeah, community. It, it's community. them coming Absolutely. out. Yeah. You know, uh, and then, then they're seeing a live show. And of course, yeah, we will just do it for expenses. But it, it's great for uh, people like me to be, yeah, working and out and about, you know. So, yeah, well, and well, May sings as well. So, yeah. She's the Tweety Sisters. One of the Tweety Sisters has made a comeback. So uh, that's all but good. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I, and uh, that's a whole new story, isn't it? <laughs> 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 but here, look, Jimmy, thank you so much for the time that you gave me today. Well, it's a real pleasure. And I mean, good luck with the, the series, obviously. And thanks to me. May was really... Oh, yeah, really for cool. all the technical, yeah. And, and, and Her technical prowess. E yes, and emailing me back and forward and just making yeah. it all so easy which is great and i i appreciate the the, the pressures in your time good luck with everything and um it's been Stop. a real pleasure from our end as well